Welcome back to Puppeteers. Before we get started with our interview with Ronnie Burkett, which was amazing, we want to give you a couple updates of some of the exciting things our guests are have been up to. Absolutely. So you guys remember Katie Williams. We had her on a couple months ago, and she talked about the Wider Earth show that she was helping to build some really intricate puppets over at the National History Museum in London. That show has been extended until February 24th, so if you live in London or look an excuse to get out there, uh, go see that show because you got some extra time. And Swazzle's doing a a lot of really cool stuff on YouTube, and be sure to check out the Kickstarter for their book, Merry Christmas Krampus. And uh, of course, we've had a lot of great Sesame people on. Season 49 is up and running now. Uh, they also just produced a hysterical new special um, starring Amanda Seyfried and Blake Lively and some other people, When You Wish Upon a Pickle. It's that special that uh, Peter Lynch was talking about, so if you are interested in that, uh, go to HBO Go or HBO Live, and uh, it's a really wonderful thing, so go check that out. And, and of course, uh, we're on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, so make sure you follow us on all those social medias, at Puppeteers Pod, and uh, we're posting every day. We'd love to hear from you guys. And if you're on YouTube, make sure to comment and subscribe and uh, ask any questions you have. Of course, we're on Twitter and Stitcher as well. It's some new stuff, so anywhere you get your podcast, make sure to find us, Puppeteers. So, uh, Adam, I think it's ready for the show. Without any further ado, here's our interview with Ronnie Burkett. Enjoy, guys. These are interesting times in which to live, but I think for the few artists who embrace it, this is a seminal moment to be an artist. There is so much to talk about through fable and metaphor. The audience comes in knowing everything I know. Everybody knows the news. Everybody's had a day. Everybody has an emotional life. So you can be, you can do a piece like Crave with no language or with no storyline really. And the audience will understand it because the audience comes in smart and ready to go. Welcome back to Puppeteers. I'm your host, Adam Krutinger. Sitting next to me is our trusty co-host, Cameron Garrity. Hey, everybody. Merry Christmas. And today we have the honor of talking to the uncomparable Ronnie Burkett. Woo! Welcome back. Woo! Welcome to the show. <laughs> Welcome from Canada. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, one of the reasons we want to have Ronnie on is Adam and I have known him for about uh, uh, probably eight years or so now, I think, was when we first met. And um, it's just had been a wonderful mentor to both of us. He's kicked my butt a number of times um, as I've taken his courses at the uh, O'Neill Theater Center. Uh, one of the world's foremost uh, marionettists and all around puppeteers and mentors and just a lovely, wonderful person. So we thought uh, our final live interview um, of the first year of Puppeteers, no better to have than Mr. Ronnie Burkett. So Ronnie, welcome to Puppet Tears. Oh, I'm thrilled, guys. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. So you've got uh, Little Dickens coming up, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Little Dickens was a really stupid idea I had one night, uh, which was to do a Christmas carol with the Daisy Theater cast, improvised. And I wrote an email late at night, I was on tour to a theater in Vancouver because uh, the Daisy has played Vancouver five consecutive years and sold out at the same theater. So there's a huge audience. And I thought this is only gonna work with an audience that knows all the characters. Um, I'm and sorry, before, you, before you get too far into that, could you just describe what the Daisy Theater is? For the Daisy not? Theater is, is uh, is a show, it's kind of my toy box. It's a, a show that I do, it's two hours long, uh, and it's a sort of vaudeville variety improv show. Uh, currently we have 54 marionettes that really have nothing to do with each other, and I go out and make up a show every night. There's musical numbers, there's uh, set characters who appear in every show. Um, and so it's just kind of my, um, experimental lab i didn't expect it would work this well and it's been on the road for five years and it's just going to go till the end of my career i think so no, it's fantastic too i went last year with my wife and we had such a great time and especially with her she had no idea what to expect because actually it was kind of kind of a mistake i made when uh, we were heading up to the show i said i said let's go see a show in canada she's like oh that sounds great what are we going to see <laughs> and i said oh uh, uh, It'll be a surprise. And she's like, oh, she's all excited. And then when we got to the border, I, you know, she's in the car next to me. We had to tell her, what are you, what are you doing here? I said, we're going to see uh, a puppet show uh, at, at the Daisy Theater. And then Maria looks at me. She's like, we're going to see a puppet show? 
<laughs> like, oh. I'm like, yeah. She said, you said it was a surprise. I said, a surprise just means you don't know what it's going to be. It doesn't mean you're necessarily <laughs> going to love it. But when she got there, she absolutely fell in love with it. And uh, Schnitzel specifically was her absolute favorite. And I think you say that is a crowd favorite as well, yeah. right? Schnitzel, yeah. Schnitzel is a is a tiny little uh, creature who uh, longs to be a fairy, longs to get his wings. Um, uh, and I, you saw it in London, Ontario. At yes, the that's Theater. right. Yeah. And it was during that run, Adam, that I had this stupid idea late at night to do a Christmas Carol with the Daisy Theater cast. Uh, I wrote that email that night and 12 hours later it was booked for a month long run. So um, we uh, in the shop made, a, I think we made eight extra marionettes. So schnitzel, uh, we made two more schnitzels because schnitzel was going to play Tiny Tim. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Esme Mazengill, who's the faded, drunken, bitter, horrible has been actress, is Scrooge. Uh, Edna Rural is another main character, a little farm lady who comes out and talks in a chair every show. So we made a, a Christmas tree dress that That's gets right. plugged in for Edna and she does the audience <laughs> thing along. Okay. Anyway, I, I didn't think it was going to work, guys. And uh, it sold out and people loved it. And we're going back to do it again for another month. And it's booked for the year after that. And I just heard somebody wants it for the year after that. So I have a beloved holiday classic on my head. <laughs> oh, my God. And that's the soul right next to you, right? This is, this, is the, uh, this is the Cadillac schnitzel. This is the main acting schnitzel. Yeah, we have oh five schnitzels now. Um, oh, my yeah. gosh. So then do you re-sculpt that each time? Or you, you must have a mold, right? I made this um, when I started doing the Daisy because it, like I said, uh, it wasn't a scripted show. And with a scripted show, there's always a design sense, you know. So there's a proportion or 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 something that I'm following tonally or sculpturally. But with the Daisy, I could just make one-offs. I would get an idea walking home with my groceries and go, "What about a cow who does this?" And then we would make the cow. Um, and so I decided each head sculpt would be a, a one-off one of a kind so these are sculpted directly um and so all five schnitzels are slightly different however when we were building little dickens i decided to make uh, molds off the last ones of edna esme and schnitzel so we do have the three main characters molded now just yeah. to speed it up in the future that's great yeah. Yeah. Now, um, as you created uh, the the little Dickens, are there points in the show that allows you to have the same amount of like improvisation and making it a little bit new and a little bit fresh every oh, night, which is really the foundation of the day? Totally. Um, I, I think you guys met my stage manager, Crystal, yes. um, who's a goer. So we had built eight puppets. John Elkhorn had done tracks for seven songs, uh, you know, Christmas standards. Uh, so we have songs all through the the show we got a new front curtain made with the show logo and some new backdrops but guess what we didn't do write down a script or what we were going to do and uh literally an hour before opening night crystal and i looked at each other and went uh, what are we doing and i said just we know where the songs go follow me so i did make it up uh and and coming up to it uh again we didn't write anything down from last time. <laughs> so, yeah, it is totally improv. Uh, luckily, uh, Christmas Carol is one of my favorite stories of all time. So I, I kind of know it inside out. I know a lot of the, the key lines from the Dickens text, and I can throw those in. But uh, yeah, it's pretty free for all. And of course, there's audience participation. So people come up on stage and do things during the show. Do you record all your shows to, to document them and in, in case no. there's something, a gem? No, really? Oh, no, God. never. You gotta do that. You gotta yeah, never, never, never. Just so, put it on a shelf. <laughs> there's a, there's a built-in terror, but that's kind of the point of the Daisy Theater. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. And um, so, what was it about? Because uh, you know, the Christmas Carol, I think, is one of the most produced and retold mm -hmm. stories out there. What What is it about that story that you? Um, are drawn to and wanted to kind of read. I, I am drawn to stories of redemption, you know, and I think Christmas Carol for all of it, I mean, the thought that it happens over the period of a night and there's fantasy and there's mystery and there's ghosts and it makes a character look back on their life. I love that stuff. Like It's a Wonderful Life, all of those yeah. stories. Um, and I love those kind of journey stories like Wizard of Oz, where the central character has to work hard to get home or get back to their true self. So um, I, I find it a beautiful story because of Scrooge's redemption at the end. 
Um, and so I think uh, most regional theaters have a version of Christmas Carol out there, and uh, everybody has a version of Christmas Carols. There's singer-songwriters who do solo Christmas Carol tellings and all of this sort of stuff. So I wasn't looking to do a Christmas show or a seasonal show, but it, like I said, it was a really stupid late night idea. It made me laugh to think of Esme Mazengill playing Scrooge. <laughs> and, and so that was the main thrust of why I wanted to do this. Her right. redemption is not as beautiful as the original story, as you can imagine. But um, right. But it is, I mean, one of my favorite Christmas songs is In the Bleak Midwinter, which is a really powerful and, and heartbreaking song. And so at the end of Little Dickens, Esme, Edna, and Schnitzel sing In the Bleak Midwinter. And, and it, it's oddly quite beautiful, oddly enough. So I think after all this nonsense that we go through improvising with these characters, the show does come back to the spirit of what it's all about. Well, and there's something fun, too, I think, uh, you know, especially if there are people, obviously in Vancouver, you say you have a, a nice little following, yeah. but for people to be able to go into a theater, um, if they are being surprised uh, by their by their husband or whatnot, um, <laughs> yeah. to be able to know a bit of the script and then to see how you deviate and play with it yeah. is fun, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And especially because a lot of people do know the certain key lines from the from from the, the text, even if they don't, if they couldn't spew them to you now, when they heard them, they would go, oh, right. That's in every version of Christmas Carol. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, when I was in, in college, my my theater advisor and I always joked that we were going to do a version of Christmas Carol. Uh, but instead of Scrooge starting out very cynical, he was actually going to be the complete opposite and right. reel into Christmas and just loving it. And then he's visited by three ghosts who show him like why he he needs to be a little more unhappy at, at Christmas time. And it's just it's such a fun f f formula to be able to just. Yeah kind of play around like a sandbox you know i was um uh, you know i'm more about original material you know that right. I, yeah. I i'm a writer I, that's what i'm known for in puppetry is writing scripts uh for adult audiences but I, I was uh i just read something the other day about adaptation and if you're going to adapt something from another source be it a book or a movie uh, and put it on stage what are you bringing to that that is specifically um and inherently uh what the stage does best. So I think with the Daisy, it's the sense of play and it's the sense of the audience being involved well. For, for example, during Fezziwig's party, Fezziwig is played by Dinah Duya, our drag queen character. And uh, we get people up from the audience and they wear Santa hats and it's a party for the whole theater actually. So that expands it a bit more in that scene. Yeah, it's so interesting that um, that you do all these improv shows like that because because like you just said you are well known for your writing. Do you use the improv shows as a tool for writing in a way ever? Yeah, I mean, the, I'd done the Daisy Theater over twenty years ago as an experiment um, when I was living out west in Calgary because I was coming up to a show called Tinka's New Dress, which was kind of a career changer for me, and. Uh, Tinka's New Dress, uh, I, I decided to make it really immediate. It was a show about a puppeteer who goes underground. And then we see his show twice. So there's a show within a show. And I thought the only way to make that really live is to improvise it every night based upon the news of the day. And I'd never improvised. So I built a bunch of puppets. I built a little stage. I booked a theater. And I did this Daisy Theater first outing. It sold out. It came back for another month later on. And it was kind of a training ground to learn how to improvise in the moment. Um, fast forward a couple of decades after doing these big, unwieldy, dark, increasingly dark adult puppet shows. I mean, the last one before the Daisy was Penny Plain, which was about the last three days of civilization. And literally every character dies, you know? <laughs> and I thought, I gotta lighten up. I gotta have some fun again. I gotta make puppetry really, really fun. Um, and so I pitched the Daisy Theater and it got a, a booking and an opening. And like I say, I didn't think it was going to have the legs it has. I remember telling my agent during the first run um, of it at a festival, I said to him quietly, don't book this one. Don't book this. This isn't going to go anywhere but here. And it's been on the road five years. So you never know, right? So to answer your question more fully, Adam, it's um, I've taken what I've learned in the last five years from the Daisy to the thing I'm writing now. Because yeah. the new show uh, will, I will honor every word of the text, every show. There's no improvisation in the text. 
but I'm going to improvise the staging every night. So it taught me to be more playful and take risks again. Um, and one other thing I'd, I'd want to ask about the the Daisy, and then we'd love to get into some of your where where you all got started and such. But when you were working on uh, Tinka's new dress, I, I read in an interview you you talked about how um, you felt at the time that you could only do this because you were an angry young guy. Yeah. You could only go out on stage. So, um, are you? an angry or older guy now what what allows you to what what energizes you to to do the daisy is it just how crazy the world is how, the, the, uh, what, what's your point of view going in certainly that's part of it but my point of view changed drastically in the last five years and and i think it's one of the necessary and great gifts i've been given i um when you're an angry young performer and and we we all are when we're young because mm -hmm. we have to tell the audience everything because we figured it out um i i've learned how smart and valid the audience is as part of what i do the audience is equally 50 percent of the theatrical experience they're not just people who put on their shoes and coats and pay money so i can pay my mortgage they are actually a necessary element and i think when i was a younger performer i would go out and do battle with the audience i wanted them to be the same every night um, and now i realize when i'm backstage doing my little ritual that i do every show uh i actually am so excited because i realize for the next two hours these are my best friends nobody who's paid money and left their house or driven to canada like adam Mm -hmm. Nobody in that room wants this to be a failure. Nobody is coming to hate this. So I get so excited realizing these are my best friends for the next two hours. And my view of the audience has changed. So while I still may rage through characters or have a political point of view or just be stupid and funny, you know, uh, I, I, I'm playing with the audience and, and I, I'm not doing this for myself. And I think when I was younger, I was, it was kind of um, a little more all about Ronnie. Um, yeah. And I'm glad I was that guy, but I couldn't pull that off now. And it's also not of interest to me. Um, so that's what I talk about a lot now, if and when I quote teach, unquote, is the importance of the audience, you know, and their intelligence and, and their generosity. Yeah, I was listening to a, an interview with um, Brian May, the lead guitarist of uh, of Queen, and he talked about um, you know when they were just getting started, they wanted really the audience to just kind of sit there and and listen to their their music, and th they eventually were kind of annoyed that people started knowing their songs and singing mm -hmm. along until realize he finally said like, oh no, we have to embrace this, and that's why he wrote "We Will Rock You" and literally gave the audience a chance to participate and you know stamp and clap and really make it this singular experience for everybody in the stadium. And I think that's really what you've been able to bring with the Daisy and bring people. Well, and in. too, you know, um, in the uh, earlier incarnation of the Daisy, uh, a character named Zelda emerged, who was a little fairy. Zelda hasn't worked in 25 years, but uh, that character became schnitzel in tinka's new dress the first incarnation of schnitzel not this puppet that's beside me uh and schnitzel was immediately popular and one night a schnitzel string got caught on his little chair and it was really funny you know i just played up the shtick of the string and finally i had to reach down and just take the string off but i had schnitzel curse mm. schnitzel swore and i got a big laugh but there was a woman waiting for me backstage who read me and she yelled at me and pointed her finger and she said don't ever do that you ask us to believe in his innocence you ask us to invest in this character and then you have to throw your own uh, your own point of view in there by cursing and that's not what schnitzel will do and i that was a really good lesson of if i'm if i'm asking the audience to be one half of the character's life their breath I got to get out of the way and just let them be who that character is supposed to be. So I've learned all my best lessons in front of an audience. You know, so it's um, it's it's a, a real good playground. I love it. Well, uh, if we could go back to sort of the the beginning now. And um, who was the young Ronnie Burkett as a kid? <laughs> everyone, everyone's dying to know. What age are you looking at? Seven, oh, yeah, I, I guess more so well, when, when maybe you first discovered puppetry, whenever that was as well. Um, I was seven 
and uh, the uh, my my parents had done what a lot of um, middle class people were doing then. They bought a set of the World Book Encyclopedia, and uh, which was kind of you know old school internet, I guess. Go look something up in the book. Mm -hmm. And I was bothering my mother one day at lunchtime, and she said, "Go look at the books." And I sat on the floor, uh, grabbed a random volume. It turned out to be the P volume. It literally fell open to the two page spread on puppets. And uh, I looked at it. There was a picture of Bill and Cora Baird. There were some other pictures. I looked at it uh, and thought, well, that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. My mother called me for lunch. I closed the book and that's all it's ever been. So that's how that started. And that year, The Sound of Music came out and the Lonely Goat Herd sequence was in there. And, and so I just, I, I was seven. I lived in Medicine Hat, Alberta. Um, I wrote Bill Baird a letter and told him I could move to New York. Never got a reply. Wrote him when I was 10 and said, you can actually adopt me and I will move to New York. <laughs> Never got a reply. Um, so I just started writing fan letters and I went to the library and that's why behind me are 1500 puppet books because books gave me this life. Uh, long before I could leave home or, you know, master tools or build anything. I, I learned 12 different knee and ankle joints by the age of eight. So, and then I learned my history through those books. Um, and that's why I love these books. That's why they're in the middle of the room. Um, so, so then what grabbed you about, about puppetry? Was it the building aspect more so or the performance aspect? Uh, without was, a doubt, obviously both. Yeah, it was everything, Adam. I think, really? you know, and I don't think this is a story unique to me, but I was a loner child. I lived in my head. It was a rich fantasy life. Um, and uh, I, y y you know, I, I think a lot of people identify with the notion of being other whatever that means. Um, I, and I'm learning more and more that most people I know consider themselves other, <laughs> whatever that really does mean. But when I saw that spread on puppetry and I saw Bill and Cora Barrett surrounded by all these things, I instantly knew here was a way to satisfy everything that interests me. I could build things. I could, um, I could design them. I could make them. I could perform them. And a little thing in the back of my head instantly knew I could do this by myself. That's exactly and, what made me fall in love with puppetry too. You know, it's right. an art form that has two lives, the sculptural art and then the performance with it. And then, yeah. Uh, oh my God. And it, to this day that I, I understand that seven year olds moment more than ever. Uh, it, it honestly, it saved me. It, it saved my life. Every time life has gone a bit south, this craft has saved me uh, because it gives me a place to create and have a point of view. You know, I was I was having a long chat um, uh, last spring and summer with various people, uh, you know, because of the new discussions that we're having about identities and all of that stuff. I also realized looking back from the age of seven on, I was playing with gender. I was playing with age. I was playing with all the isms that we're looking at so closely now. Puppetry, um, whatever I had in my head. You know, when I went to theater school, they honestly sat me down and said, you will, you will always be this height and this skin color. You can play five years older and five years younger, and you will always be the best friend of the leading man, so learn to tap dance. That's what they told me. <laughs> and I, I already could tap dance. But I, I actually... Um, I actually realized how limiting is that because I'd already started touring when I was 14 and I had been the witch and Rapunzel and the dragon and the magic fish that comes out of the ocean and whatever. I, I already had this limitless vocabulary as a performer and going to theater school, they wanted to cram me into the box that was this physical package I inhabit day to day. And, and that just doesn't interest me. Um, so before that, because I've I've heard you talk about this sort of seminal moment of finding the encyclopedia, but did you have an interest in art or performing before you opened that book up or or what were you like a little before that day? 
Um, I, I, I was a loner who made a lot of crafty things and mm. drew and uh, talked to myself and uh, was always performing something in the basement, usually by myself, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, that was all in full play. So um, I, I, there, there was no choir of angels and the sky didn't open up and a beam of light hit me saying, thou art anointed as a puppeteer. There was none of that. But I think when I saw puppetry, I went, ah, that's where all this stuff can go. Mm -hmm. right. It's not that if it had opened to the plumbing page that you would have immediately. <laughs> I was going to ask. You know, bless, bless their souls. That was the joke in the family. My parents for years were like, why didn't it open to podiatrist or pediatrician? <laughs> you know, and it had it, you know, had it open to one of those. Who knows? Maybe I'd be Dr. Burkett now. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Oh, my gosh. That's great. So then you start touring at, at 14. And was it before or after that time that I, I know you started, um, you know, as you tried reaching out to, to Bill Baird, you, you really did the old school sort of apprenticeship in, um, in sort of, you know, visiting other puppeteers and, and living with them. And wh when did that s first happen for you? That started around 14. Okay. Um, I had, um, I, you know, I'd written a lot of fan letters because uh, when I was 10, I got a junior membership to the Puppeteers of America. And suddenly there were addresses in, mm. in their directory. So God help everybody on the planet. Um, <laughs> a lot of people got fan letters with the invitation that I could come live with them. You know, that was always the first invitation. I would like to come live with you. Um, <laughs> and Nothing like uh, getting a letter from a seven-year-old saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and a few of them did write back. Uh, God love them. And... Uh, I took them writing back as an invitation to a lifelong association. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Noreen Young in Canada here had a television show that I loved so much. I wrote the CBC station where the show was produced. She wrote me back a long handwritten letter. I said, how do you make your rubber headed puppets? And she, the first letter I have from her, she tells me her whole technique, where to buy the rubber, how to mix the plastic. Like she did that. Well, Noreen, um, Noreen is coming next week to just hang out for a day. You know, I still know her. Um, so anybody who wrote me back was stuck with me. Um, and when I was 12, I took uh, the Stevens Correspondence course in puppetry from Martin Stevens. So you would pay $30 and get 20 sessions. And once a week, you would get a session in a brown envelope in the mail. It sounds really dorky. Uh, and session 20, he would write for you. You would write specific questions and he would write it for you. But as dorky as it sounds, that correspondence course in puppetry at 12 years old was the basis of all my technique. He covers writing, vocal production, design, construction, how to market your show. And uh, even though I've expanded on it and learned different things, pretty much when I was 12, Martin Stevens gave me the basis of an entire career. So it, that was pretty valuable to me. So, so what was the first show that you took on tour? What did that? Look it like? was. Uh, it was called the Patchwork Girl of Oz. So it was one of the Oz stories, and uh, it was written by a puppeteer in Boston, Eleanor Boylan. And I would pay her five dollar royalty for every performance I did. And I also, it was recorded, you know, so I, because that was professional puppetry in those days, you had a recorded soundtrack. So I bought this enormous, heavy secondhand reel to reel <laughs> thing that we would lug around. And uh, I think the first gigs were $50 gigs. And then I eventually got up to like $150 gigs. Um, I mean, the best part of that in, in reflection in my memory is that I was too young to drive. So my dad would have to take time off work, load up the car and drive me to my gigs. And uh, some were overnighters. So there'd be a motel, there'd be diner food. I never thought of actually giving him part of my $50 check. <laughs> so my dad had to be my roadie until I was 16 and could drive. Um, and, and I was missing a lot of school come the time I was in high school. But my art and drama teachers, remember this one, Adam, my art teacher, and my drama teacher both would mark me present in class because they both said to me, you're getting better experience in art and drama by going and doing this. So we're not going to squeal on you. you know? oh, and my high school drama teacher is still in touch with me and a, and a great oh friend. So, Where was all this? Uh, was this in the same area that you're living now? Medicine Hat, Alberta, in southern Alberta. Okay, yeah. wow. And of course, when I was 16, I got my driver's license and bought an old station wagon from my drama teacher, actually. And I suddenly was 
on the road, you know? Yeah. So then what, cause you ended up, um, uh, was it for college that you first came to the United States? Um, cause didn't you go to Brigham Young? Uh, yeah. I, I'd gone to a couple of puppeteers of America festivals, you know, and this okay. is the other thing. I mean, I don't know who's what parents are going to put a 14 or 15 year old boy on a plane by himself and let him go somewhere strange and hang out on a college campus with a bunch of puppeteers or let me take Easter break and fly to Detroit to live downtown Detroit with two puppeteers I'd never that they had never met you know so my parents were <laughs> my parents were pretty amazing you know because uh, they would drive me to the airport and say okay see you in a week and a half or whatever did you uh, have any siblings what's that Do you have any siblings yeah I had a brother yeah okay. I had an older brother yeah, oh, okay. who was not into art or anything. So <laughs> no, I, I was I was the oddball. Um, and my parents, I think, tried to discourage it until my dad saw me making those $50 gig checks and suddenly went, OK, we're in business. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so I did go. Uh, I got a scholarship to go to Brigham Young University in Utah, and I went for one semester. And uh, that's when they sat me down and told me you know, this, 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 this is what your career is going to be. They also told me, oh, we train people to teach theater, not be in the theater. And I thought, oh, no, 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 no. So I went back to my dorm room one night, put together a portfolio, two portfolios with photos and stuff. And I sent one to Henson Associates with a letter saying, save my life. And I wrote an impassioned plea to Bill Baird saying, oh, please, you've got to save me. The, the, the last chapters of his book said, it's our duty to train the next generation. And, and I quoted him and I said, I'm the next generation. Get me out of here, please, please, please. So, um, and I left Brigham Young because I'd heard there was an international puppet Congress, an UNIMA Congress in Moscow. So uh, instead of going back for the second semester that year, I got a job in my hometown, made some money, signed up for that trip and went to Moscow. And it was in Moscow that I met Bill Baird. And he said, if you're stopping in New York, come by. And on my 19th birthday, I was in Manhattan for the first time, went to the Baird Theater, auditioned for Bill and got the job. So that's how all that happened. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I got, during my audition for Bill Baird, I was on the yeah. bridge. I was terrified of heights. So my lifelong dream, Bill Baird, I'm on his impossible, dangerous bridge. Those bridges were so dangerous. I'm up there alone. He's sitting in the theater. It's just us. I'm working a marionette for the first time. <laughs> I dropped the puppet. So there, can you imagine? Like your lifelong dream and you drop a Bill Baird marionette. And from the theater, all I heard was, well, come down and pick it up. So I flew down the ladder, picked it up, went back up. So you know. <laughs> it's like a bad dream or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, it's like literally seeing your life flash before your eyes. It's over. Yeah. That's well, it. Sometimes that they learn a lot from that, seeing how you handle something like that as well. Yeah. Probably. It's sometimes more important than the performance. That's interesting. Yeah. It was a pretty great time because uh, before before that tour ended in New York, that tour group of puppeteers to the Unima Congress, we had also gone to London after Moscow. So we were in London for a couple of days. And I did have an invitation to go out to, I think it was Elstree Studios where they were shooting the Muppet Show. Uh, I think it might have even been the first season or the second, maybe the first season. And... So I got to go hang out at L Street Studios and watch them and meet Jim Henson. And um, so that was a kind of magical period. And I really felt like I was that I was straddling, straddling, really getting into puppetry, you know. Um, and so when I got the job with Baird, I went home for the summer and then I moved to New York when I was 19. So I know you do like uh, pretty much exclusively marionettes now, but mm. when you were starting, you did all different uh, styles of puppetry. Is that correct? Absolutely, I did. Uh, I did hand puppets when I first started my touring shows. Uh, a lot of people don't know this about me. I did television for years and years and years and years, and so I bu built a lot of um, hand and rod uh, television style puppets out of foam, out of uh, latex rubber. Uh, I've done hundreds of episodes of children's TVs, commercials, industrial films. I actually thought for a long time that was going to be my career. Uh, I think I did that for a good 
15 years or, or longer, well into my 40s, I was still doing television puppetry. Um, and when I was in New York, of course, the Baird Theater timing, uh, the Baird Theater closed during the season I was there. So I have the distinction of being the last puppeteer Bill Baird ever hired. And I, I got to be in that magical theater and that magical company, but it closed and I was in New York. And so uh, I heard through the grapevine that Bonnie Erickson had left Muppets and started her own shop and needed somebody to do something and went over and Bonnie Erickson hired me. And I worked for her for a while. So, you know, I, I got to sit in Bonnie Erickson's studio and watch her flat pattern and carve foam and flock and learned all that at the feet of that great puppet artist. So timing again, right? Oh yeah, she's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I got to see a demonstration from her when I went to a, tar a John Tartaglia did a workshop in New York City mm. and she was a, a guest artist and she did a whole presentation and she was just so sweet and man, she showed us all this kind of old footage that she had mm. and taught us all these techniques. It was, it was remarkable. You know, I have a lovely story about Bonnie that, that ties to something I did want to say that um, the generosity that's been shown to me by this community and by uh, other puppeteers has actually been the thing I think is the sweetest about being a puppeteer for me. So uh, every time I performed in New York, Bonnie would come see the shows. Uh, and when I did the Daisy Theater in New York a few years ago, I went to her place for lunch one day on, on my day off. And uh, she took me into her workroom and she, she had an entire wall of fabric and laces. And she said, these are the laces I've been collecting for 40 years. And she handed me two shopping bags and said, take whatever you want. <laughs> she said, you'll use it. So I have the most extraordinary collection of vintage laces courtesy of Bonnie. And, you know, that's the kind of stuff that's on Schnitzel's tutu and, and all these costumes. Um, and so that, you know, how many years, how many decades later did that happen to be in her workroom? being gifted with stuff she had collected. So, you know, that kind of generosity has been everywhere in this career. Well, and you've obviously had a significant role in a lot of our contemporaries and passing down some of, of what you've, um, you know, learned over the years. And it's, it's been a wonderful, like you said, it's, it's building that community. But um, I was wondering, so as you were kind of going back and forth between different um, touring gigs and and um, conferences and festivals and such. Were you also at the same time that you were reaching out with Bill Baird and and some of the the people who are ahead of you? Were you also building a, a set of contemporaries who you were able to kind of bounce back and forth with? Not uh, really, and that's what's fascinating to me about uh, the world of the young puppeteer now. You know, I, I there's a. Uh, there's this pack of uh, young guys that have been at the O'Neill twice, you know, um, uh, one's from Whitby, one's in California, one's in tour in New York, one's in Chicago. They met as teenagers online and, uh, and had almost daily discussions and agreed to meet at the O'Neill. I would have killed for that kind of um, connectivity with a community when I was a loner making puppets in the basement at the age of 15. I, I didn't have that. And because I lived in Medicine Hat, Alberta, there wasn't a puppet community anywhere near me. So um, no, I, I once I started going to festivals, that's when I first met some puppeteers who were my age then, and I still know a lot of them now, uh, but it was pretty isolated, guys. It, it wasn't this, it wasn't this community that exists now. And, yeah. and, and I think that's why I love being part of the community now, uh, because there's such an easy way to connect. Well, look at us on a Sunday morning. I know you guys, but we're doing this. I would have killed to do this back in the day. Oh, uh, yeah. 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 I pinch myself now that we do this kind of stuff too. <laughs> it's just, it's so much fun. And um, yeah, to be able to share, it's, it's just a wonderful yeah. experience. Yeah. Um, it was kind of the inspiration for this too. Cause uh, we just said, I said, you know, I want to talk to more of our friends, more people that we know, more of the artists. And I think other people might want to hear it too. Again, mm -hmm. that was the inspiration to do this. So yeah, I, well, I've loved, I've loved listening to it. You know, it's like you always learn something you don't know, um, or you might have uh you might have a, a previous opinion about something and you go, oh, that's how that happened. Or, you know, 
the trajectory of work and art and life in the arts. It's that I think I think a life in the arts is always interesting to hear different stories of because it's hard, right? It's right. Oh, it's yeah. really hard. To- <laughs> Not only is it hard, but it looks different online too. If you look at some people's Instagram or stuff, you're like, wow, they're making it. You know, I get some emails from me, uh people asking, hey, can I join your team? Are you hiring? Is like, I don't even make money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there is that part of social media. If you only present your your glam life, right? <laughs> right. Put your best self forward. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so when you were doing the the television stuff, you know, I'm sure it was a lot of, um, you know, the kids things, and I think you've mentioned it was all the the stuff that happens between commercials and mm-hmm. such. But yeah. w- when you were doing it for so long, and you you've mentioned that. Um, you did think it was going to be something that you did for the rest of your life, potentially. What what did you most enjoy, enjoy about that that had you focusing on that versus the marionettes at that time or versus hand puppets or anything else? What, what was driving you then? Um, you know what? It was the thing that was going on, Cam. Uh, I think around the time when I was still in New York and the Muppet Show exploded mm-hmm. and then everybody just started thinking that way. And, uh, you know, the thing is, when I moved to New York, to, to, to reference your previous question about did I have a community, um, when I moved to New York, that was the most amazing thing is suddenly I had an entire circle of puppeteers as friends. And from that big circle, I could actually find best friends who were puppeteers. And that was just, there was no way I was leaving New York quickly, even when Barrett's Theater closed. I'm like, I am not leaving this as we call it, the O'Neill, this tribe. Mm-hmm. But the, the tribe was all focusing on foam and television because that was the explosion and that was the thing that was really popular. Um, so uh, that's what I started doing. And when I came back to Canada, um, I had I had those skills. So it was easy to start getting some commercial work doing that. Um, I, I was a little ahead of the game on other people. Um, but I... I, I think I just thought marionettes were old fashioned. And uh, also my mentors were all very elderly, primarily the marionette guys. And um, you know, no mentor is easy. My mentors were grand, complicated human beings. You know, I love each of them to this day, but they were human and hard. <laughs> and, uh, I had to wait until they started dying off to revisit marionettes, if that makes any sense. Um, But I was missing the theater. At some point, that's what I do. I'm a vampire. I need to be in a room with human beings and feed off them in the dark. Um, And so I think from day one, puppetry for me was supposed to be theater. And... uh, and as I started looking around in the, in the uh, 1980s, early 1980s, of what could I do, I didn't want to do television-style puppets in theater. Well, look what happened. We have Avenue Q. We have all of this stuff. So it obviously works, but I didn't want to do that. And I thought, what's new in the theater with puppetry? And I thought, well, what's old? Nobody's doing marionettes for adult audiences. And let's tear down the proscenium stage and show ourselves and show the mechanics of it. And that was kind of new and refreshing in a weird revisiting the old school way. Yeah. That's something I wanted to ask too about. Um, I remember I've seen the Daisy Theater, I think two or, th- or three times now. And um, it, it, you're you're in mostly plain view of, of the audience. And mm-hmm. I know there are times, and I, I thought it was maybe just because I'm a puppeteer and I, I like watching puppeteers at work, but I went with a, a civilian, as you call them, who, yeah. <laughs> who, said, <laughs> who said that they were doing the same thing of um, sometimes their focus would be on schnitzel or one of the, the puppets on stage, but sometimes they would just look up at you. And is that something at all that you um, you stage in either in the lighting or anything where you ever want the focus to be more on you than on the puppet to to drive a point home or anything, or is well, that just easy? You know, Cam, we ha- I have very limited tech stuff. I I control half the lights that are on stage, and then there's lighting from outside that Crystal 
the controls. Uh, in the uh, previous shows, the bigger shows, the lighting design was, you know, maybe 300 lighting cues. So yeah, we could, we could light me or not light me uh, mm -hmm. as, a, uh, as needed in the dramatic moment. Um, in Penny Plain, the show right before the Daisy, I was up on three high bridges and I was just in shadow except for one section. Um, because I, uh, the, pre the show previous to that, I was playing a main character in Billy Twinkle. I was Billy Twinkle. And, and while that show was successful and I toured it for three years, I, I just felt so exposed. And it was around the time, okay, here we go. It was around the time when I realized everybody was visible on stage. It wasn't, um, I didn't think a dramatic choice. It's just, again, the herd was doing what the herd was doing. And you couldn't swing a cat in puppetry without hitting a puppeteer in the face. <laughs> and I was railing about this and talking about this, I think, you know, and, and I thought, well, as always, whenever I'm critical of something, I'm really just talking to myself. So at some point I catch myself and go, well, Ronnie, do it. So in Penny Plain, I got up out of the way. I wanted to see if I could make a two hour show with marionettes live just with the marionettes. Uh, so that's why the strings were a hundred inches long. I mean, it, it was a whole other vocabulary of how to manipulate. So I did that. So I'm always playing with that of who am I in this? Why am I in this? And I think in the Daisy, the, the premise is the audience knows this is a guy who doesn't know what he's doing and he's got all these puppets let's go you know so i think it's i think it's valid that you see me mm -hmm. um and it's really lovely when you can't look at me because schnitzel's more interesting to look at you know that's mm -hmm. and that's magic time right that's what our craft that's the drug of our craft right right when schnitzel becomes real i imagine when you were beginning you did a lot of it all by yourself and i know you still do a lot of it yourself as well mm -hmm. um you but you also work with other artists and bringing in people and and uh i imagine uh go to other people's expertise for things like the lighting and things like that oh absolutely yeah yeah i mean th this is a one-man show but it's uh, but there's a lot of people behind the one-man band you know um and for example kim crosley uh has been my uh, costume builder for 30 years um Kim's a, a cutter at the Stratford Festival. She's a professional costumer. And Kim comes in and makes these ridiculously uh, beautiful things. Uh, Cami Koo, who's uh, uh, one of the hottest designers in this country, working in Russia and New York and all over Canada. Cami still, still gives me a week here and there and comes in and she makes all the little leather shoes. There's no reason that Cami needs to make leather shoes for the crappy money that I pay. But for some reason, I, I can attract these great craftspeople in small doses. I've had, you know, amazing studio assistants. Jesse Byers, who, who had worked here for two years, best studio assistant I ever had. My stepdaughter, Gemma. Dina Meshkalite, the most uh, perfect puppet craftsperson, worked with me for seven years. So, yeah. And then, of course, all the theater things. I have a stage manager. We talk to lighting designers. Uh, composers so it is it is making a real piece of theater it just happens to be with puppets yeah at what point do you realize that you need to get someone in uh someone else into to work on a part of it is it something that you either don't have time for or a different skill set it's sometimes mostly adam that uh the vision is bigger than my ability or time you know so uh you know if you're if you're making molds and building 40 marionettes that's 80 legs to sand. <laughs> uh, that's a lot of heads to cast. Uh, there's a lot of base coat painting. So it's it's usually because of that, but uh, because the work is getting smaller, both in scale and in terms of puppet numbers for me right now, um, I, I'm able to get back to the beginning of it and do a lot of the stuff myself. But I, you know, I just spoke to a puppeteer I really admire, a puppet builder I really admire in Toronto, Drew Lamb, and, I, and we'd never hung out, and, and Drew lives a few blocks from here. It's crazy. So um, Drew's a guy who can figure out mechanics and stuff. So I, I said to him, hey, could you make a marionette scale umbrella that's a walking stick, and at the end with one string, it goes up and it's an umbrella? And he went, I can do that. So <laughs> that's when I go to people, because, you know, I'm, I don't think that way, right? So. Right. 
uh, I'm not a Max guy at all. So if I need anything like that, I know that there's other people to go talk to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I love the story that you told um, to us when we visited one time of the the rubber chicken hat that you worked on oh, yeah. and the, the, yeah. the process of trying to figure out the perfect way to get just the right movement and sheen on the red. Yeah. And, and I, I, I got in touch with a woman who does, a, she was a doll maker and a sculptor in California. I've, I hadn't met her at that point. I've met her since. And I'm like, how would you do this? And she said, here's the smooth on products you want to go get. And here's, here's how you tint it. And here's what you're going to cast it out of and we did a couple test runs and we had the perfect wobble on the rubber glove for the thing so we have a rubber glove on a marionette and without any rigging that thing just wobbles on top of her head you know the amount of work to make that rubber glove on top of her head. <laughs> but every night it makes me giggle when she comes out and yeah. she's got a rubber glove that wiggles you know there's nothing like a puppet with sympathetic movement of yeah. just extra extra stuff that it does. Yeah. I love it. Um, so uh, we've we've um, been hearing a lot about um, one of the the new pieces that you're working on, Forget Me Not. Um, you already started talking about it a little bit um, as this piece that you know is is going to be very much scripted, um, but the audience plays a a really big part in it. Can you talk about? Um, yeah. that a little bit it's um it's uh it's a show for 70 to 100 people a night no more absolutely never more than 100 people a night and the audience is on stage with me be it a large theater stage and 1200 empty seats that the, no one gets to sit in or because it's more a festival show than a regional theater show uh perhaps a warehouse space or perhaps an abandoned store uh, my dream is a tent in the middle of the forest that the, everybody's bust out to and you follow a lit path to find it. But it is truly immersive and interactive. Uh, while there's a script, everyone is the staging. And in fact, I, it's impossible to come up with a set design when you've got 70 to 100 people moving around whatever that non-traditional space is. So more and more, I'm thinking of the audience as the scenic element. How can I use the audience as, as a set in a way, um, it's a huge risk. It's it possibly a career ender, possibly the worst idea that's ever been done, but man, it's got me jazzed. It's, I'm so excited. And everybody in the audience at some point, there is a ritual where everyone is given a hand puppet. Um, and we have 115 one of a kind hand puppets that we're working on. And so they become the mob uh, Adam, if you and Maria came together, uh, if you had different symbols on your puppet, you'd be separated. And you'd be separated by class, you'd be separated by age, or uh, all of these things. So it's playing with the audience, it's giving the audience an, an other. The, the hand puppets are actually called the others. So if you come in as you, I'm probably going to pick a puppet that's completely the opposite of you, and you're encouraged to just put on a different skin and, and be that thing. So you're going to actually assign these to people or they pick it out of a bin? Well, in the ceremony, I give them out. Yeah. So okay, if, wow. if, uh, if you're standing in line next, I'm not going to give you a puppet that looks anything like you. I'm going to give you something different, you know. Now, the audience doesn't get to talk. That's the rule. But they they do a lot of things. I mean, I just wrote a scene yesterday. There's there's a big hand puppet out. There's a show within a show. So there's the Zacco Bedata show. And I've been laughing out loud all week writing this. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so funny and so dirty. I, I just can't wait to do it. Because the show is not funny and dirty. It's quite sad and dramatic. And it's being written as poetry, primarily. But the show within the show is just ridiculous. Funny, his partner, not so bad, not so dies doing a tightrope act. It's a hand puppet doing a tightrope act. So just think about that for a minute. Um, <laughs> and he dies. And so the puppet gets put in a little coffin. And then I get six of the hand puppet audience members to shoulder the coffin. And we do a, a procession through the theater before Nutso is buried. So there's all that kind of play that's happening. Um, so how do you workshop something like this? I can't even imagine. You must have done yeah. tests already. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to workshop it the first time in January. And, um, you know, it's, well, it's also the time we live in. How much permission do I have with people? You know, how much can I actually uh, put my hand on someone's back and, and, and lead them somewhere? You know, so it's, um, it's going to be very interesting. And I want to, I want to play with things like, um, you know, in the 
in the theater when a, a patron in a wheelchair comes, they take out seats and the wheelchair is always going the same section of the theater. And I, I want to play, I want to get some people who are in chairs in the room and see what permission I have of staging a scene around them on their chair and all that sort of stuff. Um, so that's why the staging is going to be improvised to a great extent every night because you have no idea. And, and for example, these things that we have and we tell people to turn off our devices when we go to the theater, I'm just going to ask them to silence them because there's a whole entrance of the main character where I want the audience lighting the way with their phones, you know? So I'm trying to think of what's the reality of people of a hundred strangers coming in and what can we do with them and what do they have on them? So will this work <laughs> i haven't a clue <laughs> wow. and it's a it's a post a post apocalyptic type thing it's a, a world after language right yeah it's it you know uh, a couple years ago uh, myself and my playwright friends were all writing things that were post apocalyptic or in the near future and um the way of the world right now we've all had to start from scratch because things have gotten odder and stranger and possibly worse than we were writing about so it's in the very near now possibly it could be tomorrow or next week. It's not that post-apocalyptic anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, language has been suppressed. Written language, cursive handwritten language is actually illegal. And the only language we have is, is our devices, which is all emojis and characters. So there is no written language. So the basic premise is that there is one old crone, not the only one who remembers how to do cursive handwriting, uh, but the only one who dares. And so People come to her legal camp to have their love letters written and read. And if you get a love letter written, then you have to make an epic journey to deliver it. And then that person has to make an epic journey to find the camp again to have it read aloud. So it's about love letters, really, and the, the risk of love and all that entails and the important of lang importance of language. Ooh, yeah, I can't wait to see this. <laughs> it's be great. a hand puppet show in the middle of it. So, you know. Right. Yeah, I got a question right. about your audience. Like, who do you notice that a certain type of people come to your uh, shows? Is there a certain demographic at all? It, I just had this chat with a publicist last week, and, and I said, I'm sorry, I'm your nightmare. There is no one demographic. And they said, that's what we're learning. Uh, <laughs> on any given night, there are students. There are seniors, there are a row of bears, there's uh, someone in full drag, there's, uh, you know, the Daisy in Vancouver, even though it's sold out for five years, um, I always ask, you know, how many people are repeats? Still every night, half the audience are first timers. So it's word of mouth, right? And I've been getting with the Daisy Theatre, a lot of people having their first experience seeing live theater, just because somebody at work said, no, you gotta go see this thing. I can't tell you what it is, but you won't, like if I tell you what it is, you won't go, so go, you know? Yeah. Um, so th they're everybody. It, 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 there is no one demographic. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a nightmare to market. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was gonna say. Yeah. Oh my gosh, wow. <laughs> Now, when you, uh, uh, we both follow you on, on Instagram, and um, I've b been really intrigued by your work, uh, uh, maybe you're further along with it now, but you had been working on creating the, the, uh, the, the sculpt for your lead, uh, yeah. for that character. Um, you mean this thing? I do mean that. Um, <laughs> it, it was, oh it was so uh, wonderful and, and eye-opening. Yeah. Well, you know what this was? This was my, um, I had a couple weeks where I, uh, this summer where I was going to just sit down and play with designing the show. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I, I couldn't draw. I mean, I can draw. I just didn't want to draw. I was being petulant. I was like a child. Like, I don't want to draw today. So I <laughs> loft around the studio listening to music and checking Instagram too much. And then I thought, you've got to get to work. So I thought, why don't you just play with plasticine? I started sculpting little tiny heads. There were no stakes in it. It was just sketching in plasticine. Went through about eight heads and then this emerged. And I went, what is this? What What is this? This is my style guide for the show. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, this plasticine 12 inch tall um, uh, maquette that's kind of falling apart became the style guide of the entire design. Um, and uh, kind of was a really great jumping off point for me. 
Yeah. And um, because I, I when at least when I've seen you design characters for the Daisy Theater, you do these very detailed um, renderings that yeah. it's sort of a you know front on side um, thing. So to see you sculpting in, in plasticine was was really incredible. Well, um, and last week I actually did the template drawing the blueprint of her. Oh, OK. And she's in three different sizes. So on that marionette template, you see her my real size. You see her small and you see her midsize because every scene is designed specifically. So there's a lot of 12 inch marionettes in this show, too. Go figure. And what what is uh, remind me this this sort of standard size that you typically work? Well, with? I have a very bizarre scale that I made up. It's five okay. inches equals a foot. You know okay. the the American standard is four inches equals a foot. So mm -hmm. that would be a, a six foot tall puppet would be uh, twenty four inches. So my six foot tall puppets are thirty inches, just because of the kind of venues I play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got it. Um, but so you were working on on this character um, after you had already created at least some, if not all, of your hundred hand puppets that you mm -hmm. were working on that. So that this character has become sort of the style guide. Was that influenced by the sculpts you were creating of the hundred hand puppets? Yeah, I think so. I I, I do. I I just know I wanted to do something different sculpturally and and tonally uh because like i said the daisy's going to go on till the day i die so i'm always going to be doing more daisy characters and i'm sure in five years we'll have a hundred daisy puppets so i always get to make those kind of puppets and those kind of characters so yay i know that um and i just wanted to uh, again play with scale i i wanted a smaller things and i wanted to represent the characters in the most uh, efficient and beautiful way for the scene. So we see this character twice as a hand puppet as well. And there's a hand puppet of her who washes someone's feet from the audience and gets her nails painted with my fingernails showing. And, and so looking at the, the show and the script and thinking, what does this specifically need? As opposed to the old days where I'd write a script and then just make 40 marionettes that were all the same size you know so that that's really the play that's going on here in my brain right now yeah it must just be so technically daunting is maybe not the right word but as someone who is anxious a lot that's what i think of as just like gosh the logistics that you must have going on in your yeah and a finite right amount of time you know it opened right. in june 2019 so there is not a lot of time so after I get home from Little Dickens in Vancouver, it's 16 hours a day in the studio until this thing opens. And touch wood, it's going to work, you know? <laughs> yeah. Right. But what else am I going to do, right? <laughs> you could go into politics. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, so um, we're, we're seeing you right now in your in your workshop, which is also your your living space um, upstairs at a certain point. Um, do you have to move out of that space when you're developing a show to work in a larger area if you have other sets or or larger characters what yeah, what is seen, that process of moving you've through? seen the room i mean it's a beautiful room there can be six of us working in here or it's really comfortable at 4 30 in the morning if i'm just getting up and coming down in the dark so it's a it's a perfect room to make stuff and design stuff it cannot rehearse here can't even store stuff here, like the Daisy Theater stage and crates are all out of storage facility. So yeah, you have to find a rehearsal hall. And uh, and and like uh, we were saying about Forget Me Not, to actually workshop it with, with bodies in the room. I mean, this is not, in the past I would do script workshops where I would just do readings to get a sense of the script, none of that. It, it actually has to be workshopped in the room with, with bodies. So yeah. that means, yeah, we have to go find a, a space somewhere else. Yeah. And and will those people um, be familiar with with who you are? Are you hoping to have um, you know a, a kind of audience that um, has has never really seen or heard of your work? Well, what I think what's do? going to be interesting. You mean with when I'm performing the show, Cam? Or, well, uh, or when, when or more so when you're workshopping it, because you know it, it, there's a different experience of having me or Adam at one of yeah. your workshops versus you know someone off the street. So well, that's my my preferred is we got to find some civilians. I would rather have six or eight civilians than forty theater people 
Um, I mean, the obvious thing is I can get probably space and a lot of bodies if I align these workshops with a theater school. And there are many theater mm. schools in the Toronto area. And, and they're very good theater schools. I just don't want people whose first inclination is to perform. Uh, uh, so I'm actually thinking of getting like an industrial base somewhere and just getting friends to put the word out through social media. And, you know, even if it's people who can only come two hours on a given night, uh, a different bunch of people, I would rather have civilians come out because mm -hmm. they will not want to perform. They'll just be there. Yeah. Well, there's some abandoned grain silos in Buffalo if you want to come down for a weekend or two. <laughs> <laughs> Will they let me in? They, they actually they do uh, performances and stuff in there. They do all sorts of projection shows. We have aerial people every okay. once in a while come come down. Yeah, they're these. They must have. They must have cleaned it up though. I used to sneak in there and play paintball with my friends. It used to be, it used to be a mess. Yeah, there's there's a couple places in Silo City where yeah. you really can kind of just Silo like, City. Oh, that that's makes what they me call it. Buffalo just for that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, because we have we have General Mills here. Um, yeah. so actually, when you're downtown, you could smell Cheerios mostly every weekday. Um, yeah. but there, there's I, other I, spaces. Cadbury's factory just across uh, the the rail tracks here. So on a good day, I smell chocolate in the air. Oh, it. that's oh, dangerous. That's <laughs> Oh my goodness! You know, I, I want to bring up your studio again. Your studio is so beautiful. Yeah. When we when we had the chance to go there, it was just so in, inspiring to see the layout and stuff. And uh, what a, what a nice space you have too, and and how nice it is. You must love having it right below you too. Is that like I don't know, I, I know a lot of artists that I know. They just you know you get inspiration whenever, and just to be able to go downstairs to your workshop, it's got to be great. Yeah. Um, and, and there's good separation, too, you know, between church and state, uh, if you will. Uh, I, I'm pretty uh, pragmatic. I, I don't. Well, lately I've been coming down in my pajamas, but that's pretty rare. I, you know, I get up really early, guys, like screamingly early. Um, and uh, and I have coffee and check emails at the kitchen table, take my shower, get dressed, and then I come downstairs to work. Um, and pretty much stay down here. The advantage is if you if you're doing something that needs to be braised for dinner, you can run upstairs and throw it in the oven. So that's <laughs> that's pretty great. But yeah, my studio spaces I have even when I had literally no money, I always really tried to make my studio space a, a beautiful space for me because I've always felt it is my only safe place in the world. The minute I go out and start performing. And I've known this since I was 14. I started getting reviewed when I was 14 years old. And sometimes they love you and sometimes they want to run you out of town. So that's just part and parcel of the job. Um, uh, my studio is, is where I get to take risks and play and be unabashedly myself, which is not for everyone. I can't even stand myself some days. But that's why the books are out. You know, I, I want all my dead mentors listening and I want to be able to grab them. And, and I'm organized because I know a lot of people work in chaos and I've seen great artists who just have these chaotic workshops and it works for them. Mm -hmm. But I, my mind works in the way that if, if I'm designing a costume, for example, and I think, I wonder what some blue trim would look like there. I want to go exactly to the tin where the blue trim is, pull it out and go, yes or no. I don't want to stop and look for blue trim for an hour. So the reason I'm so organized is I just want to grab it when I need it and not stop the process, really. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so just going, seeing studios is so inspiring because everyone does it so differently in a way that works for them. That's actually one thing we want to start doing on here is have a little segment where we go on the road once in a while and do a little studio tour. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah we'd love to do that with you if, you, if you'd ever be willing to get some Absolutely, something. because I'm the same. I love seeing where people create their, yeah. you know. We got a list of people we want to hit up, so. Too, you know. Yeah. Um, I had 1,400 square feet before this with 14-foot ceilings, and I didn't need that much space. And when you have that much space, you save everything. And so moving out of that studio into this one, we filled two dumpsters. I, I, I had saved 27 boxes of plaster molds from the old days, I, from shows that were retired, and lugged them across the country and moved them every time. So mm -hmm. by moving into a smaller space, I realized I can get rid of all this you're throwing away history how <laughs> dare you but we're also you're gonna drown in it though yeah you can drown yeah in we're, it. we're complete hoarders because we're always going to use that thing i'm just gonna right so i you know once i thought that you know the um, uh, deodorants that have the rolling ball in them 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, years ago. Year, I'm talking, I was a teenager, and I went, oh, I can make an orbital iMac out of these if I figure it out. <laughs> so I mentioned that to my mother. When my, when my mother moved out of her house, she had about 100 of those. I had apparently said save toilet paper rolls. She had garbage bags full of toilet paper rolls in the basement, and she just kept saving stuff. I'd said, oh, save tuna fish cans because I can pour barge into them, you know? Bags of tuna fish cans. So... <laughs> I can only imagine. Oh my god! Uh, yeah, that's one thing I I always gotta try to get myself to do. I've been trying to yeah clear things out. You wouldn't think so by looking at my studio, but I actually I'm trying to get better at it. It's so hard. You might think I could use this one day, but it's like you just it's just taking up space. You gotta just make room sometimes. Yeah, yeah. But I, I'm sure you find I don't know. Uh, I do most of my work on this cutting mat that I'm sitting at. I do, or in the back, you've seen the the world's smallest wood shop that I have. Oh my gosh, yes, it is. Oh my god, it's my favorite room in the world. It's my man cave. It it's is a glorified the closet. It is yeah, beautiful, it is. and oh it's got everything. About that. I need, but I have a smaller cutting mat there, and that's where I've jointed every puppet and done the the real meat construction of every marionette in the last 10 years has been made at that little cutting mat in that tiny little room and, and that's what it's it's taught me is you know what i i want to make the work smaller the audience is smaller i want to make my workspace smaller i i still say to this day the greatest puppet show that we haven't seen yet will be built on someone's kitchen table it yeah. really will be and it'll be made with paper and glue and cardboard and it will be the thing that wins puppetry i just know that yeah. Well, have you seen the work of Barnaby Dixon? I know we had him. Yeah, on I, and I listened to your oh, podcast. Gosh. Yeah, did you, he just had this video come out on Halloween that was remarkable. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I'll make sure I link that in this video. But he's just doing some cool stuff. And like you said, it's just pretty much, uh, you know, on his kitchen table, you know, in, in, his, in his room. He's just building this remarkable stuff that no one's ever really seen before. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I, I really believe that's. I think that's the future of puppetry and the savior of puppetry. And this is not, I mean, puppetry is huge right now. I mean, in terms of exposure, but also, you know, King Kong, can we go any bigger? And that <laughs> monkey is amazing. Yeah. What Creature Technologies has pulled off is just absolutely amazing. But for people who started like me, where it's, you have to build it and perform it and schlep it around. I keep saying to young puppeteers, please, 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 please walk before you can run. You don't need to make a big theater show that's, you know, all dark and autobiographical. And, and it, it, don't start there. Learn your craft by doing small stuff that you can put in two suitcases and carry around and learn it small, make it small, and own it, you know? Nobody listens to me, as you know, Cameron, because you never listen to a word. Every, never, we all want, ever, we want to retire when we're 30. That's why. we got to make it big. Got to make it big. <laughs> yeah, and then I leapt through the screen and straggled you both. <laughs> oh, too true. Um, so we couldn't let you go without um, talking about uh, crave just a little bit because right. we we had Jean Marie on and we had Ronnie on. We've heard from so many people who just loved it. It sounded you just said like Ronnie. I sorry, Martin <laughs> Martin Robinson. Uh, we had on who talked about it, and um, it sounds like such a deviation from your norm because it had so many puppeteers. It had mm -hmm. no text. Um, can you talk about where where that idea came from and and what it was like to? Yeah. Um, as, as you know, I, I've been a guest artist at the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center National Puppetry Conference. I don't know how many times, maybe six times. I don't know. Yeah. Five or six. Uh, and uh, Pam Marciero has been very gracious in letting me decide what I want to teach. I use that word hesitantly. Um, and I decided I wanted to kind of create a syllabus of how a solo performer could write and perform you know, so I kind of came up with this methodology. You've experienced it, Cameron, and other people have, and 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 I've really enjoyed that. And then I realized, okay, I've done that. Um, uh, I, I feel a bit of a fraud as a teacher, uh, and I feel like I've disappointed people. You know, because I the one thing I can't teach is passion, discipline, and curiosity, and that's what I demand. That's what I demand. And you can't demand that. You can only demand that from yourself to stay passionate, be disciplined and stay curious. Uh, then you're on your way. And then just learn a bunch of techniques and you'll be fine. Um, but I, I said to Pam uh, the, the year 
prior to this one, uh, at the end of the O'Neill, I said, you know, how would you feel if I came and actually made a piece? And she said, this is what I've been waiting for you to ask for. And she said, what would you do? And I said, well, I, I work alone. I've always worked alone. So I'd like to work with other people and I'm always on stage and I'd rather not be in it. And I talk and write texts. So I'd like it to be nonverbal. So those were the initial self commands. So uh, uh, I had an initial idea that it would be called Crave, Cradle to Grave, and that two puppets would start one from the grave, one from birth, and they would go forward and backward in time in unison and meet in the middle, fall in love. And, you know, just basic, simple idea. Uh, built two marionettes, uh, asked for 1,700 silk roses, and chose 14 puppeteers and sat in a room for, I think, well, we say it's a week. You don't get a week to make a thing at the O'Neill because no. you're a tech suddenly, right? So I think we did it in three and a half days, actually. Yeah. Um, and got the Rose Barn Theater, which was my dream. And so we had these marionettes, but I had this crazy notion that they weren't going to be on controls, that we would put strings on them, but that people would hold individual strings. And so the company would work two marionettes. So sometimes you would have three or six people on one marionette. That was a challenge. Uh, Marcus Jamin, who came with me, figured out these winders. He and um, Annette Mateo figured out these winders so the strings would go long or short. Uh, Melissa Dunphy brought in the musicians. We had an original score. She wrote a cantata and found out that half the company could sing. I'm like, they can sing. And she went to dinner and wrote a cantata. So we suddenly had a, a score that was sung. And halfway through the process, uh, Jim Godwin, James Godwin would come in and mostly James would just come in and start crying. And then he would, uh, <laughs> and one day he came in uh, and saw me so frustrated and trying to figure out sight lines because this was all happening on the floor. And, you know, they were going to bring in extra seats and people weren't going to see overheads. <coughs> and James came in and said, oh, I've solved your problem. And I went, what? He said, I've solved your sight line problem. And I went, well, thank you. He said, and I've talked to the staff and I've talked to production and it's all set. And I went, great. What, what have you done? And he said, we're taking out all the seats. The audience will be self-adjusting. So they can move around. They can go up to the balcony. They can crouch on the floor. They can stand back on these risers. And it was 50% of the whole idea was given to me by James Godwin. The minute he did that, you know. And I, I will deviate just for a bit. I remember that afternoon uh, sitting with the company uh, in, in the room. And I was telling them about James' ideas. And I got very emotional. And I said, I wish for any of you in this room as puppeteers that you will in your career have a friend as good as James Godwin has been to me. And he just proved it again today. And that is what I talked about earlier, this spirit of generosity that someone, rather than being competitive or jealous, walks in the room and goes, I got an idea to make this better, you know? Mm -hmm. So we did it. Um, it was pretty glorious. I wasn't in it, which was odd. I had to kind of step out of it and let it become the companies and and they took it and they ran and and they were glorious um you know i know you've both heard me say this and it, it has not been disingenuous but i've always said i've never called myself an artist uh and i know a lot of people are quick to call themselves artists but not me because i always felt i hadn't made a piece of work that could only be felt not talked about and that was the standard i had for myself but when Crave was presented for the conference and for the public audiences, people had no words for the experience. It was just an emotional experience that they had. And so because of Crave, I finally called myself an artist because I had made a piece of work that could be felt rather than discussed. And, uh, you know, what a luxury to go to a place like the O'Neill, to have all the love and support, all the all the good grace of everybody around you and a company of, of puppeteers who were just on their feet the whole time. They worked like, I was going to say like animals. They worked with such focus and clarity and passion. Um, I don't think I'll get to do that again. Right. So that's a, a little moment in time in my life and career. And it changed me and it changed. It, it's going directly into forget me not because the audience was circling and invited and close and, and so it really taught me that if you invite an audience in with that kind of generosity, 
they're going to be really respectful and, and beautiful in the process too. They're not to be feared. Yeah. So there's praise. I love that. And I, I think it says a lot about you as an artist as well, that you were able to hear a suggestion um, like what James offered to you and to say yes with it. Cause in the same way that he could have been competitive and not given that idea to you, you could mm -hmm. also said, Oh, I'm uh, that's a great idea, but I'm not going to take it because someone else came up with it. Yeah. Um, and that says a lot about your generosity as well, that you, you took it in and ran with it. Well, it was one of those experiences where everybody on site wanted this to work, you know, um, I had asked for a certain amount of silk roses and Bart Rockaburton had pre-ordered that before I even got to the conference. And I remember when they arrived, you know me, I sidled up to Bart with my little, hey Bart voice and said, can I have that many roses again? And can we get them here in two days? And I said, I'll pay for them. I know I've blown the budget. And he came back to me and went, they're ordered. Don't worry about it, they're coming. So everybody wanted this to work everybody and that's not what real life is like we all hear no all the time you know i i hear no a lot and i don't always get what i want so it's always how can i make do with this money or my own resources or my own ability to make something so you know that so just that spirit of uh, we don't know what you're doing but we trust that you're going to do something yeah well, and I, I imagine too, um, uh, in, as as you were doing that, and you had forget me not in in the back of your head. Mm -hmm. did, did that make you feel? Because you've been talking about not doing that or doing that without uh, uh, seats for a long time. Did that make you feel better about kind of going into that to see that it worked with Crave? Yeah, it really did. I mean, there was a lot of stuff in Crave that I think not directly related was me thinking, hmm, let's just play with some stuff that's in my brain anyway. You mm -hmm. know? Um, and I, you know, you know, I, I would do things with the Crave Company because we had Sarah Nolan and Amy Rush and Leila Ghaznavi and we had, um, uh, Kayla Martinez. We had great people in the room. Annette, uh, Marcus, Jesse Byers was the assistant director, like really, really great people. And, you know, I like my smoke breaks. And I, I remember one day saying, okay, what I want is with all of you on two marionettes, this one falls to the, uh, this one falls. So what I need is one marionette to pick up the other one, carry it all the length of the theater down there and put it down. So I'm going to go have a smoke. You guys figure that out. And it wasn't me just wanting to go have a smoke or, or have a break. It was me realizing, Ronnie, get out of the room. These people are on the things they are watching each other and they're already a, a unison company they don't need you saying try this do that so i went out i think i was out for 10 minutes i came back in and they, they figured it out and we had a marionette pick another marionette up and walk it down the length of the thing really slowly and the final image of craig i think they're uh, craig I, there must be video somewhere um is is this piece of fabric that goes from the floor all the way up to the balcony covered in roses half the company's in the balcony and half are below and the surviving marionette climbs the wall of roses like a rock climber really slowly with this amazing melissa dunphy score as the lights fade out and i gotta tell you i've got my hair standing up on my arm it was one of those moments where you go that might be the coolest thing that i've ever seen a puppet do and the company figured that out, right? Mm -hmm. So, well, that's a sign of a good director too, because so, so so many people. A lot of times, people are first time directors. They feel like they have to, you know, essentially like puppeteer their their actors and their performers, control everything. And a lot of times, you just got to let your actors act, let your artists do what they need to do. That's why you bring them in to bring their own. Yeah, experience. I mean, I had an idea of moments that we were going to do and how <laughs> how to make them better. But no, I mean, I think the best collaborations are are when the highest thought wins you know yeah. you got to know when to show your belly and go okay that is so genius yes and <laughs> you know i would godwin walked in and said i've just sorted out your big problem and he did i wasn't gonna go yeah i was thinking of that anyway or i don't like that i did i was like what? i think i actually just hugged him and started crying because <laughs> there it was and it maybe been in front of me the whole time no, it hadn't been. It was his idea. I didn't. <laughs> I'm not going to take credit for that. Yeah. And, you know, like I said earlier, 
we work alone. This is this is a lonely uh, profession, and you have to spend hours and hours and hours and hours on your own, either writing it or practicing in a mirror or building the thing. So to go to a place where everybody in the room for that one week is just focused on being a puppeteer or making a piece of puppet theater and nobody's worried about the outside world and they make our food for us and all of the stuff is provided. I mean, I, I wasn't going to squander that opportunity. It was, it truly was once in a lifetime for me. What was, uh, where were you, uh, when the show was being performed? Were you able to be in the audience while a Ronnie Burkett show was? was yeah, I was, I was wandering. I was running up to the balcony and I was hanging over the rail and I was watching the audience and, yeah, I, yeah, I was floating around, seeing it from all different angles. And, yeah. And what, what did you learn about being amongst the audience as as it was happening? That I would much rather be performing. <laughs> 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 but there was always one moment, and and you know, I think this is um, a universal thing. The 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 music was so beautiful, and and it, and it ranged from having a, a jazz flute playing up in the balcony that was just incredible, and then this uh, choral work done by the company with the cantata. But there was one section in the middle where uh, it goes into a crazy drum piece, and Matt Dumphy's just railing on the drums, and it's it's rock and roll. And at that exact moment, Kayla Martinez has Leila Gaznavi on his shoulders and she has both puppets in her hands, raising them up into the light. Well, I'm telling you, I, I went every night. That just got me, you know, I couldn't help but cry. For the sheer visceral power of that music and that move and, and that company and, and the, the company circling around, holding the strings like a maypole, mm. it was just something that was beautiful for the sake of being beautiful if that makes any sense yeah it wasn't about anything other than it was a moment of explosive beauty and that's when i would feel people in the balcony especially just go because there was something so you hear this word a lot but it was so joyous and it felt like a gift from the company you know mm -hmm. that's what i live for when i go to the theater that moment when i'm just inside of it and it takes my breath away yeah as as jean marie said i think uh she she said it uh it was everything yes oh yeah <laughs> she said it was one of the few pieces of art where she saw it and it was music it was puppetry it was just it was a little bit of everything a lot well of we don't everything. get out of bed to be basic do we no <laughs> <laughs> let's get out of bed Only on our bad days <laughs> let's get out of bed to be everything yeah. 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 you could just see it in her face when she was explaining it like yeah. it, 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 it seemed like it was hard to explain yeah it was just there's just everything yeah well it's that thing i was saying it's it maybe it doesn't live in words maybe it just yeah. lives in the experience of the audience who's there and and you know i mean that's why the audience is so important to me in my own work uh, more and more and more. Uh, you know, let's be honest. Uh, as you well know, nobody does three act plays anymore. That's an old form. But let's look at life as a three act play. Well, Ronnie Burkett's in the third act. It, I'm not in the intermission between the second and third act. I'm in the third act. Now, I'm going to be determined this will be the longest third act in history, and I will bury all of you. But <laughs> this third act may end next week, next year, five years. I don't, I don't know. But I'm in the third act of, of being a career puppeteer, and I want to now in the third act do what a good play does, is make sense of acts one and two, uh, to find the joy and the fascination of that seven-year-old boy and and the, the dreamy desire to be in the world in a valid way of that teenage boy and not to be that angry young man who in his 20s knew everything but to take that kind of passion in a, in a new conversation a more poetic and maybe quieter conversation these are these are interesting times in which to live but i think for the few artists who embrace it this is a seminal moment to be an artist there is so much to talk about through fable and metaphor um, let's get on with it because the audience, because here's the thing, you don't have to do so much work. This is what I've learned. The audience comes in knowing everything I know. Everybody knows the news. Everybody's had a day. Everybody has an emotional life. I don't have to talk about depression. I don't have to talk about happiness. I don't have to talk about politics. Everybody knows it. So you can be, you can do a piece like Crave with no language or with no storyline really. And the audience will understand it because the audience comes in smart, ready to go. So that's what I, I'm looking over your shoulder at those bananas on the wall. I love those. 
banana musicians. So I'm telling you about great art here, and I'm seeing a box of crayons. <laughs> the puppetry, right? See, I still get fascinated by the bananas on the wall. <laughs> I made camera joke. There you go. My work is done here, people. <laughs> easy, easy, buddy. Easy. Woo. And I don't know about you guys. I mean, Adam, your work is so great and you're so generous by posting uh, your video. Like I, somebody, anytime anybody says, do you know anything about making these kind of puppets? And I'm like, here's the YouTube guy you go watch. It's, it's all there. It's clear. It's concise. It's generous. It's beautiful. But I, you know, I don't know about you, but my favorite puppetry is not what I do. It's, it's the work of other people who think in ways that I don't think, you know, mm -hmm. um, and so even though I didn't have it as a teenage boy, I have it now. I, I mean, I stay on Instagram for Mechatilde Neinebuhr in Germany. Her work astounds me. Rolf Hansen in Denmark. Who thinks like that? I'm so glad he thinks like that. And there are people all over the world who are posting their work. And I just go, man, I'm so glad you're alive. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of great to be able to see it now with the world being so flat that anyone can post anything, you know, big companies to somebody in their garage and it can, it's yeah. all available for the world to see and get yeah. inspired by. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and there are people who inspire me every day through that. So even though I've really toned down my own um, posting on social media um, and I've left some sites, uh, I, I stay on it just to get those hits every day of people I know around the world who are, creating and working and, and and i every day go oh i can't believe you made that thing i how do you think that way you know so uh, that's what i stay in the world of social media for is that exact moment of inspiration every day. i love it uh one one last thing before we wrap up um you uh asked just about every puppeteer i know that you meet um what their definition of puppetry is mm. can you share with us what your definition of puppet puppetry is and why yeah. Okay. I, I didn't have one when Martin Stevens asked me to define it when I think I was a teenager. Uh, and he said, here, you can use my definition. And uh, Martin Stevens' definition of a puppet is a puppet is the shape of an idea in motion. And I stuck with that my whole career because it satisfies the three elements. The shape is the, uh, the physical being. Uh, the idea is the conceit or the story or the premise you have to make that puppet. And motion is in performance right and i used that for years and years and years until about five years ago when i adapted it because i realized one element was missing the audience so my definition of a puppet is a puppet is the shape of an idea in motion witnessed Witness, yeah. there you go that's a humdinger eh that's beautiful absolutely <laughs> wow. Holy cow. yeah and it's it's that idea of i think uh you you've said bring making sure that the audience brings the puppet to life just as much as the puppeteer does but i do i do want to throw this caveat in fellas uh nobody can hold me to anything i've said here today because i'm still a work in progress and i'm playing with this form more than i've played with it in my entire career right now so i might change my mind on what a puppet is ask me again in five years we will. <laughs> we'll, we'll definitely. <laughs> that's right. Absolutely. Or come for dinner again, and I'll make something up. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's time, camera, for the moment everyone's been waiting for. I think it is too. In the spirit of Jim Krupa, um, do you have a, a favorite moment that you'd like to share of a time when um, something didn't go right on stage or in rehearsal, where uh, you were just brought to a moment of this isn't going right but now we can look at it and just have a, a good laugh about it a nice puppeteer moment that you'd like to share <laughs> <laughs> well i wish you'd prep me for this i've got a million of them okay <laughs> let me come to the show <laughs> i guess i've known i've heard of some crazy things going on on stage at some of your shows getting some audience involvement and oh stuff, yes but, or, or, or whatever whatever you want to tell you though a moment that i was all alone on stage and this is, this is kind of a disgusting story, but it's actually now in Melbourne. I was doing a show called Provenance. I was, the marionettes were strung the same height as my floor. So I, I was on stage the whole time, visible. I was in a really beautiful Armani tuxedo through the whole show that would get destroyed because I'm a sweater. So anyway, in Melbourne, Australia, uh, I, as, as many people know, I, I have a steamer in my dressing room and I do a vocal steam 
every night. Um, the steamer I had been uh, using was not dual voltage, didn't know that, had it in an adapter plugged in in an Australian dressing room uh, with hot water and my face is down and it exploded because of the, the voltage <laughs> and burned off my face. Half of my face was burned. Uh, the show was sold out. It was canceled. There were paramedics. I was taken to the hospital. Um, if my eyes had been opened, I would have been blinded. Uh, if my throat, had, if I'd been breathing through my mouth, I probably would have destroyed my vocal cord. Like it could have been a disaster. Uh, as it was, just my face was burned off. Um, and so I missed one show and then I was back on stage and the artistic director would come out and say, Ronnie looks like the Phantom of the Opera because this <laughs> happened. But since the play is about beauty and objectification of beauty, he's going to come out looking the worst he's ever looked. And I would come out with his face. So I'm doing a scene a couple nights later and I've got a puppet in each hand and it's going really well. And I, I'm talking away and I feel something on my lip and I'm like, what is that? And I'm, I'm like talking in two characters and manipulating two puppets and doing this thing with my lip. And I go, Oh man, that's my lip peeling off. <laughs> and so I had no choice because my hands were full but to just <laughs> swallow my lip literally <laughs> and keep going. So there, I ate my own skin on stage. <laughs> <laughs> I told that story to a very famous older Canadian actress once, and she just looked at me and said, oh, Ronnie, that's going a bit far. <laughs> so there's been many, many moments like that, but I'm, I'm sure I've got a gazillion of them. But, oh, my uh, God. Find a picnic bench and I'll tell them all. <laughs> That's it. We'll have to do a special on that. Just the yeah. puppeteers with Ronnie. Just, just, oh my God. <laughs> well, that'll have to be the after hours version. Guys. Yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. That, that'll that be the, yeah, yeah. Hey, we'll do that sitting at a bar. Right. Okay. The HBO yeah. version. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, now how can people follow your work and find out about when these shows are coming out? What's the best way to follow you? Uh, yeah, I suppose I should have a website, right? <laughs> uh, my agent has a website, uh, johnlambert.ca is a really good place to find out. Or uh, just follow me on Instagram, you know, that that's probably the best way to find me. Yeah, great. That's great. And uh, do you have dates uh, for the, uh, the uh, Little Dickens? Uh, Little Dickens is uh, in Vancouver at the Couch, I think. I think December 3rd to 23rd. And uh, then uh, Forget Me Not opens at the Luminato Festival in Toronto in June of 2019. And many more things that are booked, but I can't announce yet after that. So, yeah. Great. All right. Well, we'll be sure to include all that in, in the show notes. And, um, you know, we'd love to have you back on in five years when all of your perspective is different. When I figured it out. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Hopefully yes, sooner than that, too. We'll squeeze in one or two episodes between then. So. Right. 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 Well, thank you so much, guys. I've loved this. And Absolutely I love you. Right. You know that. We thank love you. you, too. Thanks for coming Thanks on. Thanks so much for joining us on Puppeteers. Okay. Bye. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.